Judges chapter 2 this morning, Judges chapter 2, and I want to start a series here on lessons for the lives of the judges of Israel. These characters are quite interesting, and I think you'll see this morning from the first one. But uh, I take this, the title of my message from chapter 3 and verse 9, where the Lord raised up a deliverer. Now, I again want to remind you today that even with all that's happening, God has the ability to totally eradicate this virus, totally uh, uh, cure all those that have it. He, had, he is able to do that. And, uh, but God is more concerned about our spiritual condition than our physical condition. And by the way, we ought to be more concerned about that as well. I am not saying that we ought to ignore our health, but what's more important? If a person lives and is healthy and goes through his entire life and dies without Christ, he's going to be in hell. If a person has, uh, you know, illness, that's bad. We can pray for them. Maybe they'll be healed. But even if they're not, if they know Jesus Christ, they cannot lose. They'll be with the Lord. But here, let's begin reading in Judges chapter 2. And we'll begin reading there at verse 20. Judges 2 and verse 20. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, because that this people have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice. I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein, as their fathers did keep it, or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily. Neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. Let's pray together here this morning. Father, how thankful we are again for your word. As we can go into it, we can get uh, guidance and direction. And, and today, as we see these Old Testament stories, how relevant they are for our day today. And I pray that you would encourage us, challenge us, Lord, convict. Whatever the need is, I pray that we would be open to you, your leading and do what you have us to do. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, the period addressed in the book of Joshua, it's a period of time defined by lawlessness, defined by rebellion and moral failure among the people of Israel. The whole attitude of Israel during the time of, of the Judges can be summed up in the words in Judges chapter 17 and verse 6, as well as chapter 21, verse 25. And where the Bible says this, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, folks, that's a pretty good description of our world today, isn't it? I mean, you know, do right, they do right, whatever's right in their own eyes. And, and God had redeemed Israel from Egyptian bondage, had brought them from that slavery. He led them for 40 years through the wilderness and provided their every need. And he brought them safely into the land of Canaan. He promised to defeat all of those enemies that were in Canaan and drive them out of the land. And uh, uh, if they would just do one thing, walk in his holiness, do right, live according to his, his uh, commandments. And God commanded them to enter Canaan. God commanded them to conquer Canaan. Deuteronomy chapter 7, I won't turn there for the sake of time, but you can read chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Uh, there was commandments that were given to Israel. They were crystal clear. In verse 1 of Deuteronomy 7, it's, they were to go in and possess the land. In verse 2 of Deuteronomy 7, they were utterly to destroy all the nations of Canaan. Utterly destroyed. In verse 2 also, they were to make no peace treaties with them. In verse 2 as well, show them no mercy. And now this is God's command to the nation of Israel. This is what they were to do when they went into Canaan. Verse 3, you refuse to uh, 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 intermarry with those heathens. And in verse 5, they were to completely destroy every trace of their uh, pagan religions. 
And so the reasons they were commanded to do this was because Israel was uh, to be different from all the people around them. Uh, they they uh, were a special uh, group of people chosen by God. And so they, among all the people of the earth, they alone had been chosen. And they, uh, you know, he, he had saved them, he had blessed them, he had promised them victory, and, and if... Again, if they would walk with him, God demanded total separation for his people. Yes, they were going to be in Canaan, but he didn't want them to be, uh, uh, you know, like the, Can uh, the Canaanites. He wanted them to be different, separate. He knew that if Israel allowed themselves to be entangled with the Canaanites, that they would become corrupt spiritually that they would be drawn away from God. Chapter 7 of Deuteronomy uh, clearly states that. And that is exactly what happened to the nation of Israel. And when that happened, God promised when they, if they would just walk with him, uh, and, but if they would turn against him, he said, I promise you, I will come again. I will visit suddenly with judgment and, and his wrath in Deuteronomy 7.4. So Israel had their instructions, but they failed to fully carry out God's commands in Canaan. They thought they maybe knew better. Again, we can go through the record back in Judges chapter 1. Uh, we're not going to read all these scriptures, but it's right there in chapter 1. goes down through each one, verses 19 and 20, where it shows that the uh, Judah failed, the uh, tribe of Judah. They failed to drive out the enemy. Benjamin failed in verse 21. Joseph failed in verses 22 through verse 26. Manasseh failed in 27 through 28. Ephraim, Zebulun, Asher, Nephtali, Dan, all these tribes, they failed God in driving out these uh, people in Canaan, doing what God told them to do. And then, in fact, the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they even refused to enter Canaan choosing rather to remain on the other side of the Jordan. So Israel's failure to defeat the enemy resulted in them living among the enemies. After a while, they became like their enemies and uh, adopting the, the, their wicked ways uh, of the various tribes, the Canaanite tribes around them. Eventually, Israel began to worship the false gods of the Canaanites, they begin to do things that they never would have done otherwise. And when they followed this downward path, God allowed them to know that he was displeased with them and that judgment was coming. You see, this is his people. As I've illustrated before, um, if when my children were small and we would go into the store and they would act up, well, Judgment was going to come. We had to wait till later when we got home. I, I didn't really have that big of a problem with that. But you've all seen it when you're in the store and some child is just irate and going nuts and throwing a temper tantrum and hitting their parents. And you're thinking, boy, I sure would like that. And, uh, and in fact, we would probably applaud if the parent did give them a good paddling. But, um, but they, why do we, we discipline our own children is my point. That's not my child. It's not my responsibility. I can't go discipline somebody else's children but mine. Yes. And God says, you're my people. I have redeemed you. I have brought you out of bondage. And I want you to be separate from the world. And if you're not, there's a price to pay. And so they became like their enemies. Uh, and when judgment came, eventually the people would realize that they were to blame, that they were wrong. And what they do? They would repent and seek the Lord. And when they did, what did God do? He would forgive. He would forgive them. And he would raise up a deliverer, which is what we're going to be talking about, focusing on these individuals, which are called judges. And these men and women, they helped Israel to throw off the yoke of their oppressor as well as they helped them to live for God. Israel would follow a judge until until that judge died, and then they would revert back to their wicked ways, 
and the cycle would begin again. They would repent. You know, God would judge them. They would repent. God would forgive. And then he would raise up a deliverer, you know, for them. And then uh, until that judge died, uh, they would do pretty good. So this continued for about 400 years until they got their first king. And the book of Judges is very profitable for you and I today. Isn't that amazing? A book that was written thousands of years ago is as relevant today as it ever was. I mean, honestly, some as you read the scripture, you're thinking, boy, that sounds like America. That sounds like today in our world. And uh, that's because it's the living word of God. God knew exactly what was going to happen in 2020. Before the world was ever formed, he knew already what was going to take place to this year. And so he's not caught off guard. But um, so the book of Judges, because in its pages, we see Israel faced a lot of the same problems that we face in our world today. They face physical enemies. Well, so do we. They faced problems with the world, the flesh, and the devil. And yes, as Christians, we do as well. And I, I, I want to take you know the next uh, whatever, however many Sundays it's going to take to go through the lives of these judges of Israel and see how they uh, can help us in our world today. But as we look at these men and women that God used to deliver his people, I want to remind you of this. God is still looking for men. God is still looking for women that he can use in our day. He's not looking for judges. He's not looking for prophets. Those, we don't have those anymore. We have the complete word of God. But he's looking for men and women who are willing to step out and be a leader for the cause of Christ. And so he, he's looking for those who will be uh, used to stem the tide of evil. I don't understand why that's controversial, but to say that statement to some in our society today, they don't get all bent out of shape. How dare you say that there's evil? Yes, there is evil. The devil is real. And a lot of what's happening in the streets of our cities in America is evil. And it is wrong. Uh, but uh, God is looking to raise up some men and women to take a stand for God, to take a stand for the Bible in our society. He's looking for people he can use to change the world for the glory of God. Now, some of the people he is looking for might be sitting right here in the pew this morning. It's, it's amazing that God wants to use us at all. But God wants to use all of us. He can use anyone who is willing to be used. And, you know, maybe you found yourself saying, well, what can I do? Can I one person make a difference? Yes. With God? Yes. And it starts with one person at a time. Working with one life at a time. And so I urge you to, to make yourself available to God. But some of the people that he's looking for, again, you might be here, but in that age, you know what kind of people God used? Common, ordinary men and women. They were not extraordinary in their, their selves. They were ordinary men and women. He used them to accomplish his purpose, his will in Israel. And that is the kind of people God is looking for today. Don't think that you have to be talented in certain ways to be used of God. That you have to speak uh, and have great ability to uh, drive your point home. No, look, if you're willing, and it's so true, if you're willing... That's what God is looking for. And with that introduction in mind, I want you to uh, go now to chapter 3 of Judges. And I want to meet the first judge here. I, I want to introduce you to a man named Othniel. Othniel. And his name means the Lion of Judah. He was a man definitely that lived up to his name. This guy is no wimp. And he is, he is definitely the Lion of Judah. Othniel. Judges chapter 3 let's begin reading there at verse 1. Now there are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had known all the wars of Canaan, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. Namely, five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the 
Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount uh, Baal Hermon unto the uh, entering in of Hamath. And they were to prove Israel by them, to know whether they were would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and served their gods. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam and the uh, groves. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. He sold them into the hand of the uh, Cheshire. Uh, I, I tried to pronounce this king's name, but uh, this king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served him eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered this uh, king of Mesopotamia into the, his hand, and his hand prevailed against him. And the land had uh, rest 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Now, because Israel refused to walk with God uh, and walk with the Lord as he had commanded them, he refused to drive out all these other countries, or these, excuse me, these nations, these tribes in Canaan. And thus Israel was forced to live alongside the very people that they were supposed to go in and drive out and, and to, to destroy. Now we're told in the first four verses exactly why God left these people in the land. Could God have cleared out Canaan? Yeah, he could have done that. He could have spoken the word and they would have been done. They would have been over but he chose not to do it. Look at the reasons. Number one, he left them there, according to verse one, uh, to prove Israel. The word prove means to put to the test. And God allowed the pagans to live around his people to test Israel. His people were tested to see how they would live surrounded by the wicked. Now his people were tested to see if they would keep his commandments or not. In verse four, we find out they failed. They failed that test. And then secondly, he left them there to teach new generations about spiritual warfare so that they could teach their children how to fight for God, how to stand for God. And God wanted them to learn the lessons of battles that the battle that their fathers had known. God wanted them to be strong. God wanted them to fight the enemy. Yes, the spiritual enemy, but as well as the physical enemy. When that enemy came around, and they failed that test too. It wasn't long until this caused some real problems with uh, among the people of Israel. Israel proved that they could not be trusted to stand up for God. They could not be trusted to stand up against the enemy. They proved that they would rather join the enemy than fight them. I guess their motto would be like some in our day. If you can't beat them, join them. And that's exactly what Israel did. And let's notice how God delivered Israel from a time of cruel bondage by raising up this first judge, Othniel, the Lion of Judah. Uh, first of all, I want you to notice in verses 5 through 7, Israel's compromise. These verses, they give us the ugly details of Israel's great failure here. Um, what they did stands as a stark warning to the people of God today. Uh, in any age, for that matter. What Israel did then is what we see people all around us doing today. Notice how they compromised the word of God and the will of God. They compromised the, the word of God, the will of God, to do the things that they wanted to do. First of all, they interacted with the uh, Canaanites in verse 5, and the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and, and uh, the Bible says that, that uh, there were various, all these various tribes of Canaan that they uh, interacted with. The word dwelt, it says they dwelt among them, has the idea of settling down, of settling up housekeeping. I mean, they were content. We're going to live among uh, these 
enemies of God. And when Israel arrived in Canaan, you remember, God commanded them to destroy all of these individuals. And uh, without mercy, now they're living among the people. Now, it, it took a very short time for the former enemies to become their neighbors now, the new neighbors. Now, here's the problem. Israel was supposed to be separate from the world. And we have a clear illustration of why God wanted them to be separate. What he warned them of is exactly what happened. But these people were unique among all the people of the world. These people, as I said earlier, they were chosen by God, redeemed by God. They were set apart to serve the Lord. And because they didn't, well, they opened a whole floodgate of sin uh, that would end up causing them a lot of trouble down the road and bringing the chastisement of God upon them. But in Deuteronomy chapter 7, those verses that we were talking about earlier, God reminds his people that they were special, that they were chosen, a special people. Now, do I need to remind you that God's redeemed, as one of his redeemed, as a child of God today, that we are to be a separate people as well? God wants us to be separate from the rest of the world. We also have been redeemed. We also ha have been called out, and God wants us to be separate from the world. Now, need I remind you that the Bible calls us a peculiar people in Titus 2.14. Now, that doesn't mean weird, okay? That doesn't mean strange. And it, it means that we are his special possession. We're his children. He loved us. He chose us. He sent his son to die for us. He redeemed us. He bought us. You remember 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 19 and 20, where Paul asked the question, What? Know ye not that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God. And so when we refuse to walk in his will, I'm talking about you and I. When we refuse to walk in his will, when we refuse to honor his word in our lives, then we too are opening a floodgate of sin eventually overwhelming us and, and can um, destroy us in our Christian testimony. It is a dangerous thing for a child of God to live like the world around them. You say, well, they're getting away with it. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm making my own choice, doing my own thing. But the problem is you are not your own person. You belong to God. And God's not going to let you continue to live in the world or like the world. Do, do I know what's going to happen? No. But I do know this. I believe many lives, based upon the scripture, have been cut short because of people who refuse to get right with God. And we mentioned this on Wednesday night. There is a sin unto death, the New Testament tells us. And so that's what happened to the nation of Israel. They refused to walk with God. And then they intermarried with the unsaved, the wicked, heathen people of, the Can of Canaan. In verse 6, and they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons. And so after a while, the people of Israel got so used to being among the Canaanites that they began to intermarry with them. And that was expressly forbidden of, by God. Uh, it was pure disobedience on their part. Maybe some of the Israelites, they said, you know, these Canaanites are not so bad. Uh, they're a lot like we are. Uh, they're not as bad as we were told. They, they are, are actually, they're pretty nice people. I don't like these, these Canaanites. They're not monsters at all. They're girls. They, why, they can be devoted wives. And there is no reason why we can't marry them. After all, they may have tried to justify in their minds. We might just be able to change them. Hmm. That's a lot of what happens today, isn't it? Some young lady says, oh, pastor, I love this guy. He's such a handsome guy. He's so good. And what does he say? Well, no, but I'm going to change him. I'm going to uh, lead him to Christ. You may intend to do that. It could possibly happen. But nine times out of ten, it appears, it goes the other way around. In fact, that's exactly what happened here. Israel soon found out that it was not the Canaanites that were changed. Change. It was them that was changed. 
as they married into the tribes around them, the Israelites began to lose their distinction, their national identity. The, the very integrity of their families were going to be broken down now. They, they soon lost the very thing that made them unique. The same danger definitely confronts us today. When we get too close to the world around us, we're going to soon find out we get entangled. It entangles our lives. And it's hard to break free. And uh, uh, so they, you know, we, when we get too close, uh, we'll, we'll find that we, we think anyway, that we can't get out and we'll give in. So the company you keep will have a great determining factor on how close you are to God. The people that you, and I'm not talking to just young people. Look, if we, as adults, if we hang around people that use foul language all the time, that uh, do things that are wicked and evil, it's going to have an effect on us. I'm not saying, look, we are to be friends with all, all those individuals. We are to be kind and neighborly to those people that do not know the Lord. But we are not to compromise, to try to be friends with them. They are to know where we stand with God and we stand on the word of God. So the company you keep the will determine how close you are. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Paul says, There be not deceived. Evil communication, evil friends is what it's talking about. It corrupts good manners. And so, uh, you know, children are a great illustration of that. They pick up everything, don't they? Little, when they start talking, they're like a parrot. And so you have to be careful who you have, uh, who they're around. Uh, if somebody's using language that um, is not, well, you know, I've used myself at that. I, I never was a cursor, but I would uh, get a little impatient when driving. Okay? And I remember specifically Nathaniel, and he was maybe two years old. And I said, and I, you know, we're doing something, he says uh, something about that idiot. I said, son, where did you learn that word? He pointed directly at me. He said, oh, I said that when I was driving, you know. I didn't say it. I mean, I didn't say it so anybody could hear me, but my son was right there. They're picking it all up. Uh, you know, how many, maybe you've experienced that. And he said, where did you learn that word? Kids at school, um, you know, person down on the street here. Now we have to be careful of that. And so it, it does have an impact on us, an effect on us. But the same, that, that danger definitely confronts us. And that's why we're commanded as his people to be separate, uh, to, to keep our distance from the world. Remember, remember in 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians 6 14, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? In other words, if you are not married, you should not even consider dating or being in a relationship with an unsaved individual. Be not unequally yoked. In fact, our closest friends ought not be unbelievers. Yes, they, we're going to have unbelievers as friends, and we ought to, but they're not going to be the ones that we closely associate with. How can they be? How can light mix with darkness? You know, I, I, I feel like a fish out of water oftentimes when I'm in a crowd of unbelievers. I mean, they need the Lord, yes, but I don't feel comfortable there. I'll tell you, I feel comfortable with this crowd here in God's house that, that uh, have the same beliefs in the Word of God. And, and so I don't, I'm not comfortable with the language that the world uses. I'm not comfortable with them uh, of their views on God, their views on the world, their views on a number of things. And so, we, uh, yes, we can, we are to be a witness, but we're not to be like them. And uh, so, be separate. We must interact with the world so that we can bring the light of the living Jesus Christ, the light of the world to them, the gospel message to them. Was Matthew Chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Let your light so shine before men. Don't blend in. Let your light shine. I mean, you, you know, so bright that it, it is very apparent. It's very real. It's, it, it cannot be missed. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works 
and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And they will not see that light. They will not see your works if you are trying to be like them. If we are trying to be like the world. That's what Israel was doing here. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. And it gives us in all those locations. But we must keep our spiritual distance from the world, not allowing it to uh, block out our light or to change our, our uh, message. It, it's it's a, a short step from walking with the world to living like the world. So our that's why we should never make it our goal to be follow all the fads and all the things that the world is doing. Whatever magazine is popular today, you know, this is what uh, people are, how they're supposed to dress. There's some weird things. I, I'm just waiting for that uh, customized az, hazmat suit that I can wear to church, you know. Um, they've already got them out, don't they? They've got the whole suit to cover the whole body. But, but I'm not talking about that. As much as I am the fads of this world, trying to be like the world. And that's a dangerous thing. And then idolatry uh, with the Canaanites in verses 6 and 7 of Judges chapter 2, or 3, excuse me. It was a very, again, just a short step from becoming, or walking with them to becoming like them. And you can imagine how they rationalized their behavior. Probably a lot like people do today. Maybe they said, well, you, you marry a Canaanite girl, and you just have to understand how they are. They're different. You know, they're, they're brought up differently than we are. You have to allow them, you know, because they're Canaanites, you have to allow them to bring in their gods. You can't tell them not to do that. After all, it's just part of their culture. And, you know, we, again, you can see uh, people trying to do that uh, today. So these people, the children of Israel, who had been, been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, who had been delivered from Egypt by God's mighty power, who had been the beneficiaries of God's power and work time and time again, find themselves bowing before these fake idols, these fake gods of the Canaanites. Look at verse 7, the second part of that verse. It says, they serve Balaam and the groves. Um, and that refers to a various gods or goddesses of the Canaanites. And, and I cannot even tell you or describe to you what they did in the way of worshiping these gods. Ungodly things. I mean, it involves sexual behavior. And that's all I'm going to say. Uh, it, it's wicked. I mean, it's, it's there in history. It's, it's not something that has been, uh, we're not re, redoing history, writing history at all. But the groves, and there was a wicked place as well. It mentions those groves. Um, and so here you have a group of people who have gone, uh, in, one, in one generation they're gone. They've left God. One generation from worshiping God and fighting evil, now they've abandoned God. We've seen that in our, our nation. In fact, I'm afraid it's even more than one generation. I'm not saying all across the board that every individual but there's a large generate part of that generation that has been lost. They haven't been raised in a home where God has been glorified. They haven't been uh, brought to church and taught the, the things of God. And they are living without God. They're living and worshiping so many other things in this world. And so worst of all, they took their precious sons and their precious daughters and they handed him over to the very enemy to marry. And these people that they had been utterly, or told to utterly destroy, they'd been commanded by God to utterly destroy. No, we won't do that, but we'll give our children to them. And the same danger confronts, you know, wayward Christians today. When we refuse to maintain our distance from the world, uh, we become like the rest of the world. And when we refuse, to, we, can, we continually yoke ourselves with the people of this world and, and the things of this world. We bow down to the altars of this world and we are sacrificing a generation of God. Let's sit up. Let's sit up. Listen, 
There's a price to pay. The same danger we're facing. We're teaching our children to, to that they are free to treat God and His Word as they please. I mean, too many. We, we've become so lax in our responsibility to be a teacher, to be a leader, that we're telling children, you do whatever you want. You go to the church of your choice. You can worship whatever you want to worship. We don't tell them the truth. We don't. I, I, most parents would guard their children from any uh, harm, harmful thing in this world. Tell them not to play with fire, don't run, play in the street, and, and so on. You know, uh, don't talk to strangers, don't go with strangers. But yet, we don't tell them anything about what they need to know about their soul. We don't tell them about the dangers of neglecting uh, their, their eternal soul. You see, without Jesus Christ, in fact, some of these Israelites were even sacrificing their children to these false gods. Killing their children. See, that's awful. But think about America, how many millions of babies have been sacrificed and not even given a thought. How many lives were taken this year already of 2020? Versus the lives that have been cost of, from the coronavirus. I think that's a greater crisis than the virus itself. I'm not minimizing it. I know there's, the virus is real. I'm not saying it's not. But I'm just saying we have lost the sanctity of life in our nation, in our world, and where it, it is nothing anymore. That's what had happened to Israel. They were living among them. They were becoming like them. They were doing what they were doing. And we're, uh, you know, telling... Young people today, it's all right to disregard God. You know the Bible. I, you don't. You don't need to go by what the Bible says. You don't need to go to church to worship God, and uh, you don't need to worship God. Uh, I'm afraid a lot is being said without words, just by our actions. We are telling them that they are free to chart their own course to the world. I am glad uh, my father did not trust Christ till just two weeks before he died. But he was a very moral man, and I'm glad for the directions that he at least plotted for me. He didn't say, you know what, you do what you want. And uh, I'm thankful that even though he was not a believer, there were some morals, some disciplines there. And, uh, but my point is this, Christian, mom, dad, don't throw in the towel. Don't go along with what the rest of the world is doing. You have a responsibility to teach and to train your children in the things of God. Don't expect that they'll learn everything they need to learn in the church. No, it's your responsibility. And that comes by not being a part of this world. We're not to be like the world. Your home ought to be completely different than the rest of the world. Your children ought to be able to come home and, 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 and be free to speak of God, to live, to see things in their home that will remind them of God, and to hear their mom and dad teaching them diligently about God. And if we're not doing it ourselves in our lives, words are cheap, aren't they? We need to model it. Even for the children that come to church here, maybe the parents aren't to here. They're not able to be here. Let's be that example to them. There's always someone looking up to you. Well, off the we can have a lot to say about him, yet uh, how God raised him up, how he does deliver the nation of Israel. But today, what we've seen is a, a nation of people who forgot God. And it's very similar to what we have happening in our world today. We have a whole generation, if not two generations, of people who have forgotten God. Uh, uh, I, you know, and I put a lot of blame on a lot of the churches of our, our nation. We have forgotten. We're going through the motions. And I say we, I'm just saying collectively as all the churches across the nation, many have forgotten God. They're no longer teaching them, preaching the word of God. They're more concerned about being politically correct and speaking about global warming and, and every other social issue in the world and got away from the word of God. Listen, friend, if you're here today and you are without Jesus Christ, if you're here today and if you died this very moment, let me ask you, where would you spend eternity? 
heaven or hell. You say, well, Pastor, I want to go to heaven, and, and I'll find out when I get there if, I, if my good deeds outweigh my bad, I'll go to heaven. No. Now is the day of salvation. Today is the day. In other words, what you do with Jesus Christ now will determine where you will spend eternity. Trust him as your Savior today, and you will be forever a child of God. Put it off? Well, you don't know about tomorrow, do you? Don't wait until it's too late. Let's bow our heads together.